Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So this lecture is titled Economical Writing, and it's typically the first lecture in my Ethics and Economic Behavior course. Due to the unusual nature of the fall 2020 semester, I'm planning to make an overview video that will precede this in the playlist that I'm going to upload it to, but I don't want to 100% commit myself to doing that, and so I'll talk a little bit about the course as a whole here just in case I don't do anything more in terms of like a preceding video. So the Ethics and Economic Behavior course is originally developed at, when I was visiting at the University of Pittsburgh at Pitt as a uh, writing requirement, upper level writing class, and it's continued on uh, to be an upper level writing requirement class. So it's a writing intensive course, hence the first lecture being about economical writing, but I think that's really important actually, really important skill for economists in general. And so there's actually, you kind of stand to learn quite a bit from this lecture and then from the McCluskey reading. And so there's some value there. In terms of the course as a whole, well, the point is actually to give ourselves something really interesting to write about, given that it's an upper level writing requirement course. And what better to write about than some interesting ideas in economics? So the goal of the course, because it is to give us interesting things to write about, is going to be to cover a variety of fascinating topics. And I haven't quite settled on the topic list at this point. I realize class is starting in, well, at, at the time of me filming this, in a little less than a week. And so I've, I have to finalize the list. I mean, I've taught this several times before, and I might very well just keep a lot of the same topics, but it might introduce new, new things as well. The basic structure, though, tends to be thinking about laying a foundation for the economic tools that we might apply. I mean, I kind of take as a given that students approaching the course have a background in at least principles level economics and it's got a it, it's typically got the intermediate micro requirement and so there's some places where we'll use some of the ideas from my intermediate micro playlist as well kind of to convey or to give us a, a, an additional level of rigor to approach some of the ideas uh, that said that's really interesting is like you might think having either watched the intermediate micro videos or taken taking intermediate micro or, or seeing some upper level economics, like you might think of like economic theory as being kind of strictly quantitative and mathematical involving like a lot of equations and you know, formulas and stuff like that. That's true. Like we see a lot of economic theory that actually is like math based, but economic theory can be in written form as well. I learned that lesson when I was having a conference with my, uh, one of my dissertation chairs at the time. And I'd gone into his office and I'd read a paper by Thomas Schelling. So uh, Schelling had won Nobel Prize in economics. This is, is, I forget the title of the paper. It's like a game theory paper. Something about hockey, uh, hockey helmets is in the title. Like if you Googled Schelling um, and then hockey helmets, you'd find the paper. And there's like a tremendous amount of economic theory in the paper that I didn't recognize it. And so when I was talking to my advisors, like oh, I read this paper, it was a good game theory paper, but there wasn't much theory at all. He stopped me. He's like, no, you're wrong. It's actually full of economic theory. What you mean is like it doesn't have a whole lot of math in it. Right. So we want to kind of update our expectations in terms of how we're thinking about economic theory and realizing that, you know, you can do economic theory with equations and, you know, think about indifference curves and utility functions and profit maximization and MR equals MC and so on and so forth. You can also do economic theory just from the standpoint of, you know, conveying the ideas. And that's actually going to be one of the central goals of the course is to think carefully about conveying economic theory through our writing and do this kind of really careful manner. The other, so the course starts off with this sort of foundation of, of kind of reminding us of economic theory and some interesting tools. I cover some ideas from behavioral economics, some ideas from game theory, and then this sort of, and some basic some basic uh, topics that kind of lie at the intersection between behavioral economics and like standard economic theory. Matter of fact, a lot of the topics that I'll approach, people might think of as more typically behavioral economics topics, but actually I approach them from kind of like a standard economic theory perspective, which is interesting. Things like reciprocity, which you wouldn't normally think of. You might, maybe you think of reciprocity as being a behavioral topic. And indeed, part of my dissertation is using psychological game theory uh, models of reciprocity. Anyway, so start off with a foundation, thinking about some interesting tools from economics, and then we go and kind of approach a number of topics. And as I go through the topics, we kind of infuse some philosophy as well. And so actually the structure of this playlist is gonna be, this video is either like 
first or second. The next video will be like an introduction to behavioral economics. And then the third video will be an introduction to ethics. This will provide a foundation that we'll then take to all the topics that we go forth with in the course. All right, so ethics and economic behavior, the topic here, we're thinking about economical writing. And so I'll introduce economical writing from the context of uh, Deidre McCleskey's paper. So I'll actually show you where you can get the paper, where you can get the book. <laughs> I've been talking this whole time. You're looking at this picture of this dog, and you're like, when's he going to talk about the dog? What's going on with this dog? Yeah, this is my dog. So um, this is Onyx, and Onyx has found a bucket. This doesn't mean as much to you as it will for me in terms of like when I look back at this video, and there's, you know, so this is actually just kind of like secret code to myself. <laughs> so apart from seeing my dog and hearing the story about the bucket, which is kind of prancing around here having a great time, you don't really need to worry about that, obviously. Um, all right, so oh, before I go into the lecture, though, kind of move this aside, where can you get economical writing? So economical writing, you can find it's, it's this book. So here's the book that I have, Economical Writing by Deidre McCleskey. You find it on um, Amazon, or uh, there's a newer edition, which I just ordered, and so you can find the newer edition. Okay, good. There's other options, though. So the, the book originally appeared in Economic Inquiry, and so it was right here. It was volume 23 of issue, issue 2 of volume 23 in April of 1985, um, which I was too young to read this at this point, so I discovered this much later, obviously. It's also in PDF form on Deidre McCluskey's website. Uh, oops, sorry, so this is the actual, this is the actual uh, thing in the um, Economic Inquiry, and here's the PDF. And so the PDF version, um, it's probably enough to get you by, plus with my, you know, thinking about my lecture here, going through the slides. Um, other interesting things, actually, since, since I'm on uh, Deidre's website, is uh, there is this book, The Applied Theory of Price, which is an intermediate microeconomics text, and it's brilliant. Um, as a matter of fact, like some of the exercises that I like to give, especially for budget constraints, one of these might look familiar. Uh, this, this question, I have a question that I like to give pertaining to budget constraints, which comes from actually this text. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting book. I'll, you know, almost nobody teaches with it. The, the sort of dominant book is the Varian text. And people who don't teach with Varian typically teach with the Perloff text or uh, Nicholson and Snyder. And this book is kind of largely forgotten, much, I think, much to the, um, you know, sort of a, it's a shame because it's actually, it's a really good book. And so I, this would be sort of a good supplement for thinking about, or sort of a good review for thinking about um, intermediate micro type topics. Uh, the, the other thing that I noticed is I was looking through this, this issue and I was like, what is going on in this? What else, what else was published in the volume 23 issue two? of economic inquiry economic inquiry is a so it's a journal from the uh, western economic association international I like so um, i like economic inquiry because the papers kind of focus on first being accessible being super readable which is why economical writing you know fit really well there anyway so what else what else was in this uh what else was in this issue i found two-part pricing for a multi-product monopolist and i am going to save this for myself to um, oh, maybe I should go to Honolulu. So I'm going to save this article for myself because this is actually a brilliant idea for a two-part tariff. Two-part pricing is two-part tariff. Um, so think about a multi-product monopolist. I have lecture videos on this channel, on my channel, with two-part tariff, and you could think about how you might price multiple products and what. Obviously, like what's the interesting issue for that monopolist? Well, are those goods? substitutes or are those goods complements so all right i haven't read that paper but i'm looking forward to doing so all right so now i'm going to talk about kind of the sort of topical overview of the economical writing uh i guess pdf or book and this provides kind of a good foundation for thinking about our own writing in the course so what i'm doing is i'm basically taking the highlights from the book and i'll kind of talk about them a little bit so the first observation that D.J. McCluskey makes is that most writers think of writing as they do opinions. They don't know the rules and they don't seek professional advice on writing. Moreover, amateur writers tend to view writing as more of a character caricature trait and less of a skill. 
professional writers have learned to benefit from criticism. So my, my advice is like, try to be like the professional writer, obviously, like in the writing intensive course, kind of focus on the writing aspects of some of the submissions. The other thing is like in general, kind of try to focus on improving your writing. Don't think of it as like a fixed skill. Think of it as something you can get better at by practice and practice is the only way to get better at it. Um, actually deliberate practice is really important if you're kind of following on it, like learning learning theory and, and uh, so on and so forth. But the really important thing is you wanna, you wanna take writing criticism uh, with sort of the goal of improving your, improving your writing. Also, might be surprising because, um, so I had not gotten anything less than an A on a written paper for pretty much my, as much as, as much of my life as I could remember until I took my upper level writing class when I was, well, I guess I was a junior by credits as a sophomore, so my second year of college, and then as freshman eligibility for cross country, actually. Anyway, so when I took that class, I got a C on my first couple papers. These are one page papers you had to write couple one page papers and try you know try writing that concisely it could be really kind of a trick uh, and so it's a really important skill to be able to develop writing concisely and carefully within some fixed requirement and so that's why the the history of this class used to always be one page papers because I viewed that as such a valuable skill to kind of improve your writing um, the more the version for this semester I don't know if I'll keep with it or not is uh, three page papers, but um, few, you know, fewer papers. But the important thing is try to learn from kind of learn from my own reflection, which is like, I hadn't had anything less than an A on anything that I'd written until I was pretty far along into college. And then I was getting C's and I rewrote those papers and got B minuses. I ended up getting a B in that class as a writing class. I thought for sure, I'm a good writer. I'm going to get an easy A in this class. No, anything but. And so, but think about think about sort of the end goal, which is like, you know, rather than getting an easy A, I would much rather kind of improve my own writing skills and learn that this is something to, to work at and to improve from. And now several years beyond, and this is like 2020, so this is like 18 years after I took that class. Yeah, I'd much rather, I'd much rather now have the benefit of that criticism than to have not had the class. And if I'd go back and do it, yeah, absolutely. I'd do the same thing again. And I'd have that sort of rude awakening that, hey, my writing isn't as perfect as I thought it was. I mean, I had, I had, I had English professors asking to, keep my, asking to keep my papers as an example for their future students. And then I got a C in this class. So, or a C in all my papers and then rewrote for B minuses. But there, you know, there again is sort of the benefit from criticism, right? You want to learn to benefit from criticism and realize that, uh, realize that um, you can, you can definitely work to improve. All right. So why is this really important in economics in particular? So if you're working as an economist or if you're going into grad school, really important if you're going into grad school, in in econ, but or writing research or you know anything where you're anything where you're going to be writing for a business audience or um, you know, so on and so forth. Economics depends more on writing and speaking than on the statistics and mathematics touted as the tools of the trade. That's interesting, right? So the idea is like, yeah, we need the statistics, we need the math, so econometrics, right? To be able to develop and to be able to, you know, come up with interesting results, you need the writing to be able to communicate those results, right? Writing's the cheapest way to reach a big audience. Writing forces the writer to think, Good writing pays well, bad writing pays badly. You have to be read to be listened to. I mean, that's really kind of the, the ultimate idea, which is like, you might have brilliant ideas, but if people can't distill it out of what you've written, you're not gonna find an audience, and you're not gonna have any type of influence. Or if people aren't able to make sense out of what you've written, people are gonna think you have worse ideas than you might. And so, um, it's, you know, it's really important to learn to be able to write clearly and concisely and to be able to communicate the results in a way that's going to be able to be interesting and uh, and to you know to be able to catch people's attention right to this end like thinking about whoops thinking about uh, writing forces the writer to think right so we think of writing resembling mathematics in particular 
the idea is like math is a language. It's an instrument of communication, right? Communicating, um, communicating ideas on, on the one hand, just as writing does. On the other hand, language is a mathematics. It's an instrument, instrument of thought, right? So just as like to be able to come up with some interesting mathematical insight, you've kind of got to work out the problem. Similarly, you gain greater and deeper insights into whatever it is that you're thinking about by having written it down. I mean, countless times I've come up with some idea that I thought was going to be a brilliant paper topic, brilliant lecture, and then I wrote it down. It's like, this is horrible, right? Or I wrote it down and then better yet, you kind of see some flaws that you're able to fix, right? So the idea is uh, we can communicate with math, we communicate with language, we also kind of develop our thoughts by writing out steps of an equation. Similarly, you develop your thoughts by writing out and forming arguments verbally. That's sort of really important. The big idea that uh, DJ McCleskey is kind of talking about here is, well, the observation that you don't learn the details of the argument until writing in detail. And then writing in the details, you undercover, you uncover the flaws in whatever the fundamental uh, aspects of the logic. You know, if you've, if you've ever tried to like, you come up with some brilliant idea and then you try to convince a friend of it, try to explain it to a friend and they ask you a couple questions and then you realize either it wasn't that great of an idea or you didn't understand what you thought you did, right? It's like through communication that we kind of, and, and even, you know, just seeing the, seeing the communication, seeing the, seeing the words written out on paper for yourself, we kind of maybe provide greater scrutiny into the underlying ideas than we would have otherwise. When things are bouncing around in your head, you might think that you have way, way uh, better insights than you actually you actually do. I mean, I shouldn't just say you. I mean, like, I'm totally guilty of that myself. Um, anyway, so uh, rules can help. Bad rules can hurt. That's really important for, for writing, right? So, like, everybody's learned writing rules. And it turns out, actually, especially, like, in economical writing, DJ McCleskey's talking about, like, the need to unlearn a lot of rules that we were taught as a result of like our primary and secondary education thinking about like how to approach writing and I, like i see this in students um and i'll talk about this a little bit later in the slide deck but you know, like when all right so when when i was in high school i had pretty good teachers all throughout i had a writing class it was like a like a language arts class we were learning to do parenthetical citations Right, so you'd have like a direct quote, you'd have parentheses, and you'd have like the APA format for the citation. And the paper was like largely parenthetical citations. And then from that point on, I thought the way to write a paper was to have a lot of direct quotes in it. No, that's not the way to write a paper. <laughs> you should never have direct quotes unless you need the author's words verbatim, right? Just like as a rule, you should never have a direct quote in anything you're writing unless you simply cannot duplicate that sentiment with a paraphrase or unless it's like it's a really important like that person and their words are super important like they've got some expert or expert insight or something like that such that you lose too much uh, by paraphrasing right so if you're citing something you want to paraphrase and then cite uh, you know if you absolutely need the other writer's words verbatim then you have to use a direct quotation, but it's really bad writing to have a lot of direct quotations, especially a lot of long direct quotations. Anyway, so uh, like mathematics, writing can be learned. Elementary writing can be learned like high school algebra. On the simplest le level, neither is inborn, right? So the idea is like, you know, people don't arrive in life knowing how to do algebra, and you don't arrive in life knowing how to do writing, you, how to do writing. So these are things that we learn as a result of going through education, right? Uh, similarly, there's only a few super gifted mathematicians and super gifted writers, but anyone can learn to solve a system of equations and anyone can learn to delete a quarter of words from the first draft. I like this. So Deidre McCleskey didn't just say anyone can learn to write. Also, though that sentiment is here, DJ McCleskey is telling us that anyone can learn to delete a quarter of words from first draft, meaning like write out your first draft and then look for redundancies, look for words to, to, um, to cut down. And this is like a tool paring down your writing. As a matter of fact, when I, when I give the one page paper assignment 
tell students to start off by writing a draft that's like two or three page paper, uh, th two or three pages long, and then pare that down to one page. And so that's actually kind of how that was actually the trick that I well, I don't know if that's that great of advice because that's how I went from a C to a B minus. Um, but anyway, I think that's kind of a good idea, which is like start off with a longer draft and then uh, and then, you know, pare down the words that we that are kind of getting in the way. Right. Good writing at the simplest level follows rules, just like math. The one genuine rule, be clear. Right. We want to be really clear with our writing. In particular, uh, we want to uh, we want to be careful about being transparent, being clear, and being concise to be able to convey which are whichever are the underlying ideas. Like you might approach college writing, you might approach actually like academic writing, with the belief that big words and really complicated uh, sentence structure makes for good writing. And I think maybe the problem is like. We go through go through education. You read a lot of historical texts. You, you read a lot of ancient texts, uh, so like centuries old writing, and it's kind of pretty difficult to make it through. And maybe we think that that's how good writing is because it's a classic. No, I mean the things that I've written are, have uh, the things that I've read. Things that I've written. Things that I've read have, have typically been uh, things I've read that have been really well written have typically been the things that are just like crystal crystal clear and and so the important part is like the clarity ends up doing a much better job of of conveying the underlying ideas right so Deidre McCluskey tells us clarity is a matter of speed directed to a point bad writing stops you with a puzzle at every sentence right that's bad if you're reading through something you're like wait what is this saying and you'll you'll kind of pay attention to that you'll kind of kind of catch it um, and there's I can think of I can think of econ papers I've read where I've had had to kind of like kind of walk away from the paper because it's so hard to make sense of what they're what they're saying uh, because you know sometimes the sentence structure can be not that great. What's the problem? Well, bad writing makes for slow reading, and then people have an opportunity cost of their time, foregone ability to be doing something else with their time. And if you're like, wait a second, this isn't a good use of my time reading this reading this. Um, paper, I'm not going to keep reading it, right? How do we avoid this? So DJ McCluskey then gives us some advice. Reading your writing cold will show you the places where even you cannot follow it, right? That's one of the most important reasons for starting drafts early, right? So basically, whenever you get a syllabus and you see that you've got a final paper or you've got a series of papers, try especially to capture your first week motivation and write a draft your first week and then come back to it and revise it throughout the semester. It's best, especially for like, you know, when I'd have one page papers in this class, I'd say, write your one page paper draft on Monday, set it aside and come back to it on Wednesday or Thursday. It's due on Friday, right? And the idea is if you write something and then return to it after a couple of days, you can tell where the, where the areas are that need to be repaired much better than if you try to write it in one sitting. Right. The biggest cause of bad writing in economics, ignorance. So DJ McCluskey tells us economists would improve their writing if they read Jane Austen, George Orwell, even Adam Smith or Thomas Schelling. Um, so, ah, so I mentioned Thomas Schelling was um, the was the paper I mentioned a second ago, the game, uh, the hockey helmets, the game theory paper that had tremendous economic theory, but it had been written without a whole lot of math. What's the problem? Economists rarely read outside of economics, right? Typically stay laser focused. There's reasons for that, right? First is interest driven. Second is, well, the opportunity cost of your time, right? Like if I'm in, if I'm in economics or if I'm interested in business or something like this, you know, what's going to be the most direct sort of short term positive influence on my career? Well, it's reading things that are in my field. Think about this, like what's going to be the most direct sort of short-term positive impact on your grade? Well, reading the course readings, right? Like doing the work for what's assigned. What's gonna be most important in the long run? Well, you know, I mean, you wanna learn stuff in your classes, obviously, but you don't wanna do this at the neglect of learning other skills and other things that are gonna be important for you down the road. So, you know, it doesn't mean that you wanna read <laughs> you know, kind of like a finite amount of time, right? So you don't wanna spend all your time reading other things, but 
you know, probably good to read things outside of economics or read something for fun apart from just like blog posts or internet or social media, right? And so that's actually really important. And that's important actually for those working in academic economics and for research as well. I find some of the most interesting ideas that I've come up with for applications in economics have come from when I've read things either by economists working in other disciplines, so for me outside of behavioral economics and outside of economic history, or when I've read things from non-economists, like I maintain a subscription to Scientific American and some other uh, other magazines and then try to read whatever's, uh, whatever's popular on Amazon. Why? Well, I want to be able to come up with I want to be able to think about things and come up with ideas and see the world in kind of a different way. Remember, your brain is just taking in a lot of a lot of sensory inputs and then kind of making sense out of it, making connections, and then we're getting outputs. And you want good inputs if you're going to get good outputs. And so some of those inputs should probably involve like, you know, other things to kind of stretch your mind and make you consider ideas you wouldn't have ordinarily. A subsidiary cause beyond just having bad rules is failing to know the rules. Uh, so let's discuss the rules. What? Uh, oh, subsidiary cause besides besides ignorance is is uh, is failing to know the rules. So get the little book and let's discuss the rules. Well, get the little book. Get the little book refers to uh, well this book. Uh, Teacher McCluskey's book is is a little book. And then let's see, it is the Strunk and White book is like historically the uh, the little book that people talk about. And so because this had been kind of like the sort of quintessential writing book, you know, small, uh, DJ McCluskey had the economical writing published kind of, you know, small. So it's kind of like the uh, economist version of that book. Anyway, so let's discuss the, the rules. Well, firstly, choose a reader and stick with them. Right? Don't dwell on mundane details if you assume greater sophistication of your reader and omit trivial steps. Oh, this is super important. Like when you're writing, don't, if you're writing an economic paper, think about your audience. And if they understand economics, like don't bother time, don't, don't bother wasting time with simple definitions, right? Don't cite, uh, don't cite the textbook for like simple kind of boilerplate stuff omit trivial steps, right? You don't want to kind of, you don't want to slow down your writing by including a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be there. So you see a lot of things where, I mean, so people have a tendency to like want to cite uh, like Investopedia or like sites or um, like study sites for, for things, for kind of known, right? Avoid boilerplate, avoid that's which prefabricated and predictable, like passages right out of textbooks deriving known principles, right? Kind of like avoid those things, just assume greater sophistication for your reader. Now, if you're writing for a different audience, if you're writing for a general audience and you have to explain some of the terms, you gotta do that. But even like, okay, this is an interesting exercise, right? So think about some of the widely applicable terms in economics, like moral hazard and adverse selection, right? Run into like Google, type in moral hazard, go to Google News, and then see what articles come up where it's going to talk about moral hazard. And I would bet the majority of those articles don't really bother to define moral hazard. Or if they do, they'll give it a working definition, right? They're not going to like give the, they're not going to give like a textbook definition of what moral hazard is. They're just going to run into using the word or using the terms. And that's what you ought to do yourself. Right, clearly, impenetrable theoretical utterances have prestige in economics, but should not. I agree with DJ McCluskey here, right? Like, so the problem is we want to be really clear. So one economist might write, consider two cities, A and B, trading at an asset X. If the prices of X are the same in market A and market B, arbitrage may be said to be complete. Now, that's more clear to me then maybe I should admit, because my brain's kind of wired that way, that's supposed to be not a very clear sentence. Um, the clear way doesn't attract the attention to theory, and this is what we should aim for, right? We should think in terms of, like, this is, this is the same vein of don't kind of call, don't call attention to definitions, use sort of the working definition, sort of like a, use the working version of the theory. Don't call attention to the theory, this kind of is 
bringing us, you know, to arbitrage. Instead, right, just apply the theory. And so, for instance, New York and London both had markets for Union Pacific bonds in 18, 1870. The question is, did the bonds sell for the same price in both places, right? And so maybe this is what we're ultimately seeking is trying to a answer this question or explore the pricing of these bonds in the two locations. So it's better than better than this version, right? Key thing I want to call your attention to here is like when you're applying economic theory in your writing, it's better not to write the sort of really, uh, really theoretical version. It's better instead to apply, use the use the working version of the theory. There's, I mean, the economic theory is here in the second in the second one. It's there as well, right? It's not just in the first; it's in the second as well. But it's written in a way that's a, that's much more uh, it's much more clear, especially if you're if you're writing for like a non technical audience, right? Both the economist and the non economist have a better chance of making sense out of the second one than the first. All right, uh, no explanatory paragraph, right? Don't include a table of contents paragraph. So table of contents paragraph, or don't include the tell the reader what you're gonna say, say it and say that you've said it pattern, right? So Miss Jones is Deidre McCleskey's sort of archetype, uh, sort of uh, grammar teacher that gives us bad advice. And so Miss Jones appears quite a number of places in economical writing anytime we have bad bad advice that has been ingrained into us so but what's the important thing start off your paper start off your abstract start off your introduction with an interesting sort of motivating paragraph that brings us in if you're doing economic writing if you're writing if you're writing so the way that introduction should go is you're going to kind of tell the reader and kind of focus the reader's attention. And actually, there's an interesting way to be able to meld what would typically be sort of your literature review stuff into the introduction, such that as the reader's going through the introduction, they see the introduction, they, they see the sort of existing thought, they kind of locate what you're doing relative to what's been done before, and kind of immediately in the introduction paragraph, not only, hopefully you've motivated them to keep reading, also, they know what what you're going to accomplish in your paper by virtue of giving some landmarks for things that have been dis, that have been discussed or, or or introduced previously by other authors. So that's actually kind of super important as you're laying out and introducing like what your paper's thesis is, right? Thinking in particular, you want to write more than just around a paper topic. There's an important distinction between paper topic and thesis, right? Paper topics, it's just what you're writing about. It's kind of like the general, the general uh, area that you're writing on. The thesis is some non-trivial, non-obvious observation that you're trying to convince your reader of. And your goal should be doing that and introducing what's this thesis and then coming up with the rest of the paper being support for it. So being that that's what you're trying to focus your reader's attention around, you're trying to make them care about that thesis. You don't want to slow things down by talking about table of contents and you know so on and so forth. I, I like this advice, right, from Deidre McCleskey. The reader won't understand the paragraph until they read and then they won't need it. Right? So <laughs> readers just skip to the content if they can find it. Right. Outline the paper is as follows. Nobody's going to read. So they'll just skip ahead if they can find where it begins. Uh, the other thing that we want to avoid is to tell your reader what you're going to say. Say it and say that you've said it. That was how I was taught to write in high school. Don't do that. Right? That's not. So you can have an introduction, body, and conclusion that does everything that you need to, that introduces the paper, that motivates the paper. Then you've got the body that supports the thesis with your economic analysis. And then you've got your conclusion that focuses the reader's attention on what they're gonna take away. You can do all of that without the standard five paragraph essay format of say what you're gonna say, say it, and then say that you've said it. Uh, because of what's the problem? There's a tremendous amount of redundancy and you'll lose your reader, especially in, I mean, have you, when's the last time that you've read a news article or you know, something where somebody's actually done that. When's the last, have you ever, other than, other than in high school or other than, yeah, other than in high school where the teacher may have had you peer review somebody else's work, have you ever read somebody who's written the, the, the standard sort of five paragraph essay, right? The introduction, the three paragraph body, and then the, and the conclusion? No, you never see that anywhere. Nobody ever does that. Anyway, so, Tables are writing. 
the wretched tables in economics show how little economists care about expression, right? You want to use words in your heading. Same with equations. Anyone can retrieve art, uh, algebra from words. The reverse is pointlessly harder. These must elucidate your argument and not obscure it. Let me talk about all of this. There's a lot of stuff here. So the first thing is, if you're including tables, you want to introduce the table, kind of talk about the table, and say what's kind of going on. Use words in your headings, right? Um, also with tables, really important. You, you can't just you can't just hit your reader with the table, or a figure, or whatever, right? If a table's going to appear in the body, it's got to be really important. Otherwise, if it's ancillary, you put it in an appendix. Either way, if it's made into the paper, you're going to talk about the table. You're going to talk about the table with a paragraph that introduces what's in the par what's in the table. It's either going to say, "Here's the you know here's the table. This is what you're going to see," or "There's a table in the appendix. There's what you'll see when you go there." And as the saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. But that's kind of the wrong way to approach tables, and figures, and graphs in economics. You want to put some of those thousand words into the par into the paragraph that's explaining those things, right? Matter of fact, what I always tell students is, the paragraph that you write telling about what you see in the in the figure, table, chart, or whatever, should be so good that by the time I've read that paragraph, I don't need to look at, at the at the thing at all. If it's in the appendix, I don't even have to look at it, right? I don't even have to bother going to the end because I know what it says. You've not only have you said kind of what's in what what the figure, what the chart, what the table is showing, but you've also provided the interpretation. Like, what's the significance of it? That's really important because sometimes, especially like when you're when you're starting out or, or like going through early years of college or even even in grad school, I see students doing this sometimes where you might just have the table and you might say, as you can see in Figure One, here's you know so and so. No, I, I mean I you know I. Maybe you've maybe the figure that's expecting a lot of your reader to be able to first off look look at the chart and table and uh, determine what's the significance that you've got it in the paper for, um, also to come away with the same takeaway. There's some danger there too, which is like the reader could take away a different something entirely different than what you intended the table to be showing. Could be because you're wrong, but it could also be because the reader's wrong because you didn't provide the right sort of context and guidance. So that's really important. The other thing with equations, especially like regression equations, right? Anyone can retrieve algebra from words. The reverse is pointlessly harder, trying to get words from algebra, right? So it's really important to kind of like spell out what you're what you're doing. That's really important to kind of uh, you know be kind to your uh, reader, and then they'll be kind to you by finishing your paper. All right, so the novelist John Gardner says, become self-conscious about how much you're putting into a part of a sentence. English sentence has grammatically speaking three parts, subject, verb, and object. All right, so the subject, an English sentence. Verb, has grammatically speaking. Note, grammatically speaking modifies the verb, which is has. Object, three parts, uh, subject, verb, and object. So Gardner says, vary your sentences by how much you put into each and choose only one of the three parts for elaboration, right? So what D.J. McCluskey is sort of uh, hoping that we do here is, you know, be self-conscious about how much you're putting into a part of a sentence and don't overload sentences with too much elaboration, right? Paragraphs need a structure. Paragraphs should have a structure like A to B, B to C, C to D. Economists would call this transitive writing, right? A to B, B to C, then A to C, right? What this requires is us to violate the elementary school rule of not repeating words, right? Indeed, you must actually repeat words in their various forms to accomplish these linkages. So you're going to have a tendency to not want to repeat a whole lot of words because that's kind of how a lot of us have been taught. And I think, you know, I don't know if I necessarily take as strict a view on this as DJ McCleskey. Uh, I think other things equal, it's good not to re repeat words too much, but you want to think carefully, especially because I definitely subscribe to to the, this sentiment, which is don't invent new ways to say something just to avoid repetition, right? If you're finding that your writing has a lot of repetition in it, the answer isn't to substitute things out and to open up the thesaurus. That's not the answer. 
The answer is, firstly, make sure what's the cause of the repetition. Is it that you're following the, the sort of rule and you're sort of guiding your reader along? If so, good. Or is it that you've got kind of cluttered writing? And this is something you've got to kind of be really careful looking at for yourself. But importantly, don't invent new ways to say something just to avoid repetition. repetition. Why? What well, makes your writing super unclear? So G.G. McCleskey uh, cites an example of having reviewed a paper where the author used industrialization, growing structural differentiation, economic and social development, development, economic growth, growth, and revolutionized means of production, all meaning exactly the same thing in the context of the paper, right? So that they could not have the same thing you know, several times, right? So this is elegant variation, avoid it. All right, people are confused about the colon and the semicolon. The colon indicates an illustration to follow, just like this. The semicolon is a parallel remark. It is, as here, an additional illustration. So the semicolon means furthermore, the colon means to be specific. Semi is also used when the list is really long. In this case, it's used as a super comma such as faith, hope, and charity, uses commas, but if each item were elaborated, charity, the greatest of these, the light of the world, and similarly with each, right? then you might use a semicolon as a super comma. Semicolon is a printed compromise between a comma and a period. I don't know. I don't know that I have a whole lot more to say about that, but I think that's kind of good advice if you're using uh, colon, uh, colons and then semicolons. I use semicolons. I don't use ordinary colons much. I don't know, maybe I should. Weak writers use too many commas. Weak writers use commas by rules rather than ear because Miss Jones said so. So bad rules. An if clause always requires a comma after it. When a clause cannot stand alone, it must be hedged with a comma, with commas, right? Together, these result in commas in nearly every sentence with the result of slowing the pace. So, right, when you've written your draft, Go back and look at your commas and look to see, do you need all of them? In a lot of cases, you might not. Uh, what's the problem? Well, having too many commas slows down the pace. And I find probably like when I'm, when I'm writing, I can usually take out most of the commas. I have a huge habit of putting commas in and then I realize eh, I can probably take these out and it actually makes the writing better, right? Also, rearrange words until they sound good. Cultivate the habit of mentally rearranging words and phrases in every sentence you write. One rule of arrangement is to avoid to avoid breaking, as in this clause, the flow with parenthetical re remarks. Right? I have a habit of doing this. I also have a habit of writing things backwards, right? So like writing something and then realizing that to move it around and then it is the way that people want to read it. Kind of like Corollary, corollary advice, if it's important, put it at the end, put it at the beginning if it's not, right? So think about like the important thing. You wanna finish the sentence with right, the important sort of takeaway. One important rule of an arrangement is that the end of the sentence is the place of emphasis. So Deidre McCleskey tells us, dump less important things in the middle or in the trash. Put less important things at the end weakens the sentence. Right? You, want to end, you don't want to weaken your sentence by putting the less important things at the end. Uh, circle this and these in your draft and you'll be shocked at the number. Bad writers think that readers need to be reminded that, this is th that it is this idea, not that one, which is being discussed. That's hard to read, isn't it? Yeah, so circle this and these in your draft and you could probably remove a lot of them. Right? Consider repeating words represented by this instead. Right? Repeat the word that it's standing in for. Uh, query every this and these and remove most of them. That's good advice. Uh, watch for bad words. So such as uh, via the process of intra and or hypothesize respectively. I use respectively kind of too much. And so I, that's a bad word. Uh, at least minimal process of thus overall basic factor people like to use thus it's a bad word individual structure agents existence of time frame former ladder uh, i use that former and ladder uh, vary for convenience due to in terms of so actually why not use all of these 
there's actually kind of like an extension extensive uh, but compelling explanation so I'll say see economical writing for the details otherwise recognize that it's probably good to avoid words like these DJ McClessick gives some pretty pretty compelling reasons like why why not respectively it's redundant the redundancy right and then there's some other kind of issues with each of these here anyway so that is the sort of overall kind of topical summary or introduction to uh, economical writing summary of introduction is a summary of economical writing and then introduction to how we want to approach writing in the course uh, and then the basic idea is to think about improving think about the goal of improving your writing don't think about the goal of don't think of don't think of the goal don't think the don't think of your goal as to complete the paper or to have a submission or to get a particular grade on the paper those are all good things you want to submit the paper on time. You want, you want to complete a paper. You want to submit it on time. And you want to get an A, of course. But the important thing is actually you want to write a good paper and you want to sort of emphasize the learning process. And if you made it to this point in the video, I have every confidence that that is actually your motivation. So I'll see you in the next one.